All right. Thank you, Linda. It's good to be with you. I think I know most of you looking at the names, but if you don't know me again, my name is Lee Highsmith, and I'm married to Bucky Highsmith. And I asked my esteemed husband, do you have any advice for me? After he had watched and listened to some of the program, programs that y'all have had. And since I'm the last one, his advice was, don't you talk so much. So um, I have invited some other people to talk as well. I have been with Good News Clinics for just a little over two years, like two years and one month. And there are members of this class who have been with Good News Clinics much longer than me and have known about Good News Clinics for much longer. So I've invited um, both Linda Askew and Mindy Farron to share a little bit about what they know. And the um, Zoom master, Ron Stowe, is currently um, volunteering and serving on the board of Good News Clinic. So at different points in the program, I will turn it over to them to talk about what they know. And then I've asked Liz Coates, our new executive director, and she's been with us, I think, uh, been executive director for maybe two, two years, three months. <laughs> so we're both, we're both relatively new compared to what some of y'all may know about Good News Clinics. Um, prior to being executive director, Liz was the director of development and community engagement. So she has a lot more experience than me. And I'm going to let her do some question and answers at the end. But I also have a video that we're going to show with a patient's story. And I challenge you because I was an elementary school teacher. See if you know where this video was filmed, if you recognize the location. So with that said, Ron, I'll let you pull up our PowerPoint presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, for those who, of you who might not be as familiar with Good News Clinics, our tagline is Hope Through Healthcare, and we started in 1992. We um, are a nonprofit Christian health center, and you can see that our charge is nurturing broken bodies and broken souls with the goal of healing both. So we only, uh, and I will let you go to the next slide, and I don't want you to be confused because many of you may know us um, with the old logo that you see um, to the left, Good News Clinics, but in 2020 we updated our logo right before the pandemic hit and we went through several focus groups, some of you participated, and we now have a new logo. So as we go through this presentation, you may see both logos. One of the reasons that we changed to a new logo is there has been great confusion in the community between Good News Clinics and Good News at Noon. And of course, Good News at Noon is a homeless shelter started by Jean Beckstein, and Good News Clinics in some ways grew out of that. The story or the legend is that Sam Poole was treating patients in a handicapped bathroom over at Good News at noon and he said, we got to get a place to take care of these people that need help. And so from that, Good News Clinics was born. And as we've moved through um, the seasons of our life at Good News Clinics, we've discovered new needs and new things we needed to do. So uh, in 1997, the medical clinic added a dental clinic, thanks to the generous support of Ann Warren Thomas and George. And then in 2005, we moved to the new location where we are now at the corner of Pine Street and High Street. And if you're not sure where that is, that is just down from the public safety complex for Gainesville City. But more excitingly, it is across the street from the new skateboard park. Um, of course, I mentioned Sam Poole and Sam, uh, the late Dr. Sam Poole served as the first medical director of uh, Good News Clinics in the early 1990s after his retirement. And he had worked tirelessly to make Good News Clinics what it is today. And then in um, 2006, our medical clinic was actually named for Dr. Poole. So um, that's, those are the legends and the stories that I have heard about the beginnings of Good News Clinics, but somebody that was actually there is Mindy Farron. So Mindy, I'm gonna invite you to unmute and share with them some of the stories that you know from having served on the board and been a volunteer 
about the early days at Good News Clinics. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'm excited to be here because I have loved the ministry of Good News Clinic for over 25 years. Um, as she said, um, uh, we are a Christian nonprofit. I do have a script here because I knew I was going to forget some things and I didn't want to rely on my little brain to do that. So if you'll forgive me while I re review from this, um, we are a Christian nonprofit providing free medical and dental care to the uninsured Hall County residents who are unable to get their own health insurance. We've never accepted any federal funding, um, but rely totally on the generous support of our community and foundations. And that's been a big part of our legacy is that we're able to pro proclaim Jesus um, uh, and still um, not get federal funding because of our desire to do that. Um, in 1987, Dr. Gene Bexam, Mr. Gene Bexam, Mr. B and his wife, uh, put up a sign in the, for their front yard that said, if you're hungry, come eat lunch with us. Um, he had been a teacher and an administrator for 37 years, and he found himself in the midst of so many people that were in need. Uh, well, that, of course, uh, grew tremendously as he, they were inundated with people who wanted to come eat lunch with them. And they soon grew, um, went into the Melrose Community Center, um, and it, it grew and grew also. And they started seeing his primary focus was the, the spiritual needs, but he also wanted to um, take care of the feeding and the uh, housing uh, needs of these as well. Um, they moved, I think it was, um, it, it was, it moved across the street to a vacant building and became good news at noon. Um, and, and then as that grew, uh, Dr. Dave, Dave Westfall and nurse Susie Harris and Dr. Poole realized that the physical needs were being met on from the food and um, housing, but the medical needs were really pressing. Uh, I had not heard about the handicap uh, bathroom that Lee mentioned, but I, re I remember it was a very, very small room, much like a closet uh, that they started in. And they used to laugh about that you could really couldn't turn around without bumping into each other. Um, and so they saw those uh, patients until they realized they really had to do something. So there was an adjacent building uh, that became available and we moved in over there. Um, that was in 1992. Uh, Dr. Poole became the medical director in 1995 and I'll never forget his office. Um, he loved to cut out, he loved to cut out articles, uh, medical journals, and he would thumbtack them to the wall, all over the walls. So when you walked in there, it was just full of stuff. And he would always go and point out something and about that he was going to use this for some of these patients. And it was just such a, a wonderful atmosphere. His heart was in learning, continually learning so that he could help mm -hmm. his with all the things that were happening. Um, Charles House was there running the financials. And I started helping him uh, as a nonprofit uh, computer consultant that I had been doing. Um, we had a lot of fun. We uh, installed, uh, got the first computer with Peachtree Accounting um, and uh, Bates and Carter kind of helped us with that as well. Um, Alan Edwards is our dear pharmacist who's been there from the very beginning and is still there today. Um, he's the most amazing Christian servant uh, to everyone around him. He's been a real uh, minister to me as well. Um, he's organized and staffed the pharmacy out of a really, really small closet that had a double door and the, I mean, the top door would open and he would hang out and talk to the patients. And um, he organized all the um, donated supplies that we were getting from the medical center and other pharmacies around town. Um, Dr. Bob, Bobby Wright uh, was also seeing patients um, with eye conditions. And in 1977, uh, Dr. Ed Burnett started the state's largest free dental clinic. It was the Green Warren Clinic named after Ann Thomas's father. Um, that was an amazing time as well to see all the dentists who flocked to help. Um, he and Dr. Poole were very good at uh, guilting their friends into, into volunteering. And um, we had a, a great success with the dental clinic from the very beginning. Um, at that time, we also partnered with the uh, Northeast Georgia Medical um, uh, Foundation, Lanier Park and the Health Department. Um, to develop a medical and, and the junior league for a medical mobile unit uh, that was primarily 
for childhood immunizations. And Latrell Simpson had a lot to do uh, with that volunteer effort as well. Um, the clinics again began to burst at the seams and moved to 2009 to the current location at Pine Street. Cheryl Christian has played a pivotal role in the clinic's growth as executive director for many years. And uh, Dr. Jim Butts uh, took over for Dr. Poole after he passed as medical director. He, Dr. Butts often said that he knew that Dr. Poole was looking down from heaven. If he didn't do this, that he'd kill him. So that was, that, that was his motivation was he, his fear of Dr. Poole, what he would do. Um, the volunteer effort here, is, as you know, is unbelievable. There are more than 46 primary care physicians, nine mid level providers, 43 dentists, and 340 specialty physicians through the health access. Um, I'm particularly familiar with that because Dr. Greg DeLong was instrumental with that with health access partnership and getting physicians who could not come into the clinic because of their need for specialized equipment like my husband Hop in orthopedics, um, the, the patients would go to his office to be seen because they couldn't physically be seen with the, the kind of equipment that he needed uh, to serve them. So that's been an amazing part of, of this ministry for a long time. Um, many in our Sunday school class have served on the board. Uh, Dr., uh, Mr. Stowe is now very active and Kevin Price and of course Linda's on the advisory board. There's so, so many names and I think uh, I served over 20 years on the board and as primarily secretary. Um, but, uh, and I, I, I count it as one of the, be the biggest blessings of my life. Uh, I do encourage you all to go tour the clinic because it's not until you see it that you really know uh, the impact it's having on lives and you will, be, you will become um, convinced of the need for you to join as the valuable volunteer ministry. Um, I'm, so excited that we're getting to share this with everybody. And I, I know that you will want to become a part of it. That's all. Thanks, Mindy. That was awesome. <laughs> and um, Good News Clinics is a very special, it's a God place. And so uh, next, let's see, I want you to see one of the stories. So Ron, if you will move to our video and yeah. see if you recognize where this video was filmed. met Sheila when she came into the Compass Center over a year ago. I was a volunteer there. She came in seeking financial assistance, but she needed much more than that. Sheila needed medical care, which has been provided. Sheila needed prescription drugs that she couldn't live without, which she has obtained. In Sheila's case, this is not a person that should be facing life on her own, and she's been on her own for a few years now. I met Sheila after she was referred to the counseling department at Good News Clinics through um, her nurse practitioner, Audra. Uh, Good News Clinics has really um, been able to help Sheila in a lot of really neat ways. Um, we've partnered with multiple agencies in the community, um, DBHDD, Avita. Um, the Compass Center, United Way. Um, we've been able to partner with a lot of people to really get Sheila the resources that she needs. One of the cool things about working at Good News Clinics is um, we get to help people in such a variety of ways. Um, it kind of reminds me of the, the Bible story about the Good Samaritan, you know, and we're able to just go along and help individuals. Um, we can go the extra mile in helping them, and these are often folks that have been passed by by others. So Sheila, to my understanding, that first day when I met her had kind of flown under the radar. She had some high blood pressure issues or things that we needed to work with medication. She was very invested in what she could do to make her life better, but it didn't seem like she had enough resources in any avenue to help with that truly. And she wanted to eat healthy, but based on limited funding, she didn't really have any other options. Actually, after that first set of labs that we got, that first visit, um, it came back that Sheila did have diabetes. 
And so it was very terrifying for her. And so Olivia and I were able to talk with her about how to support and life changes, but we could get her started on medication. She comes to regular appointments now. She has medication that she probably couldn't afford or wouldn't know how to take properly if she couldn't come sit in the office and just have discussions and um, get dietary support or the things that she needed, just even to joke around. And I think your health also revolves around your spirit and like just to keep her uplifted and happy to tell her that because she is a diabetic does not mean that it's the end for her or that we can't treat this or we can't fix it. You need to help me so much. I didn't have no income. I have high blood pressure and some other medicine I need to take, but I didn't know how I was going to get it. But good news, my friend, her name is Kathy. She took me there and they give me my medicine and it's free. I mean, it's so wonderful. The people at Good News Clinic, they really cares about you. I've seen that. And if you need help, they will help you. Well, before when I was working, I used to thought I could help people like homeless people. Then I don't work no more because I have some issue, but I get food stamp. And it's just me getting that money. So I said, well, the food stamp that I get, God gives it to me. And yes, that's true. I said, okay, it's just like I'm working. So I'm going to take this much and I'm going to get about 11, 12 people and we're going to go give it to the homeless people. That's one way you can help people. So nobody can never say, well, I can never help so-and-so because if I can do it and don't have no income and I'm using my food stamp, you can always help anybody. I mean, it's not much, but it's not, it's in your heart. And when I do it, I do it from my heart. Cause Jesus knows. I don't do it this, you know, goody goody. I do it cause I could have been homeless. We'll stop that. So as you can see, uh, Sheila's desire was she is very, very grounded in scripture and her faith. And she was actually describing how she tried to give back by tithing 10% of her income through food stamps to the homeless people. It always touches my heart because we always think we don't have enough. And when I see how she, Sheila, who has absolutely what I would call nothing, is still looking for ways to give back. It's pretty amazing. But what I wanted to share with you is, is a little bit about who are these people? Who are the people like Sheila that we serve? So we serve people ages 18 to 65 who do not have health insurance and have a family income of 150% of the federal poverty level. So I've given you some examples of what is the current poverty level. So for a family of two, it's 17,420. But of course, if you go 150% of that, then we're serving a family of two with an income of 25,130. So you can add 50% to that. And you'll kind of see the income level that we are serving. The reason we don't serve residents under 18 is because they are taken care of by peach care. And we don't serve residents over 65 because they are covered by Medicare. But it's this age group, 85, 18 to 65, that oftentimes have lost their job because they got ill. And we especially see this with independent contractors, people that um, maybe do yard work or that um, drive their own truck or that might be in the construction industry as an independent contractor. And when they can't work, they can't afford their insurance and then they end up losing their job and they can't access healthcare. 
So that's a lot of who we serve. And, and what I'd like to do now is ask Ron Stowe if he would unmute and share a little bit. Ron Stowe was one of my bright spots in my day pre-COVID. Listening to him, he was, he was served as an intake specialist. That meant means he met with the people that came to Good News Clinics to see if they qualified for services. And the voice and the cheer and the welcome that Ron shared with those individuals seeking help made my day every time he came in. So Ron, would you share a little bit about what it was like to do intake and some of the folks that you met and your work with Good News Clinics now and, and also serving on the board now? I, uh, well, I first uh, heard about Good News Clinic about 10 or 12 years ago when I went to a funeral service at the church for Curtis George. Many of you know Curtis or know Ann, who's on the, in the choir. And uh, during the service, they were talking about Curtis's volunteer work at Good News Clinic, and he was a drug runner. Uh, his job was to go around to the doctors and the hospitals and, and pick up their uh, sample drugs and bring them back for use in the Good News Pharmacy. And I'd known Curtis for years. He was a Delta pilot, and I'd never heard him mention anything about the clinic or the volunteer work. And so after we left the service, I told Carol, I said, you know, it's really something. I never heard Curtis mention anything about that. And I said, that is really great. I said, you know, I've never really done anything for the community, but been a part of any organization. I've just kind of enjoyed living here. I said, you know, maybe it's time I start giving something back. And Carol said, well, are you going to do something about it? Or are you just going to talk about it? So the next day I called the clinic and I talked to Jean Peoples and told her that uh, if they needed somebody to replace Curtis as a drug runner, that I might be interested in volunteering. And she said, well, we don't need a drug runner, but do you know how to work a computer? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, come in, I'd like to talk to you. So I went in and she said, we really need somebody to uh, handle applications. So you think you could do it? So I went in and went through uh, the training with some of the other application specialists, as we call them. And so that's what I've been doing for the past 10 or 12 years. And uh, we go through a process of evaluating a person. Uh, they have to live in Hall County. They have to have income below a certain level. Uh, and so we talk to them and uh, make sure that they are eligible to be treated at the clinic. And uh, it really is amazing, the stories you see. Uh, one of the first uh, person that I talked to after I started was shortly after the economy turned down in 2008 and this gentleman came in and was talking to him and he looked down at his feet the whole time we were talking and uh, you know he said I feel so ashamed to have to be coming in here and begging for medical care he said you know I've owned my own business he said I've been self-supporting my whole life and he says really is embarrassing and I said hey you know uh the economy uh, is not anybody's fault. None of us were responsible for it. This guy had had a, um, I think a computer repair business. And at one time he had made like $180,000. And um, due to the economy, I think uh, a lot of his business had been outsourced. And one thing and another, he wound up going bankrupt and moved back in with his son. And I mean, it just really got me. This guy was sitting there and, and in tears, so ashamed to be asking for help. And I said, hey, you know, everybody needs a hand up sometime or another. So it really has been interesting. And uh, like I said, when Lee uh, or when Liz came about two years ago, she felt like it'd be a good idea to have somebody that actually volunteered in the clinic to serve on the board. Um, so, you know, I could help share the input of, you know, what it was actually like there on the front line. So anyway, that's basically it in a nutshell. Thank you, Ron. And, and you have just been such an awesome resource for me. He also serves as our fundraising events um, chair. And as you can see, we'll talk about that in a minute, but his background is highlighting our, um, our one upcoming fundraising event. But um, let's move to the next slide. And I wanted to share with you very briefly about um, Good News Clinics really has four main areas of service. 
And I'm going to go through these and then I'm going to turn the last one over to Lynn to Linda ask you to talk about. But let's go to the next slide. Uh, the Sam Poole Medical Clinic. And this is anything medical. So not only do, does our clinic look like your typical doctor's offices with wings, with patient exam rooms, and um, with a doctor's office and nurses stations, places to get weighed and all that kind of stuff. We also have a lab where we can do some lab work, just like when you go to your doctor's office. We also have an eye, cl eye care clinic, as was mentioned earlier by Mindy, um, that's named for Dr. Wright, where uh, Steve Farkas, who's a member of our church, volunteers his time. And um, this is just gonna look very much when you come visit, like you might see at the doctor's office where you go. So next slide. We have the Warren Green Dental Clinic, and that was mentioned earlier. The, the legend or the story is that Sam Poole said, I don't know how to pull teeth, Ed Burnett, you got to get over here and help me. Um, because when someone goes to the hospital with an infected tooth, the hospital gives them antibiotics. They, they cannot um, pull the tooth or do the filling or whatever is needed. So the Warren Green Dental Clinic is just so needed. And we now know that so much of oral health is related to other conditions. Warren so, Green. The Warren Green yeah. Dental Clinic uh, is amazing. They do cleanings as well as extractions and fillings, and they also teach people how to care for their teeth. Uh, next slide. And then we have what we call the dispensary. And you might think of this as a pharmacy. The reason why it's not a pharmacy is we do not dispense narcotics. And um, one of the easiest ways to think about our dispensary is when you see that ad that says, if you could not afford your medicine, AstraZeneca or whoever the pharmaceutical company is may be able to help you. Well, that is true, but the paperwork required to get those prescriptions is extremely complicated and um, oftentimes something that our patients would not feel comfortable filling out those forms or knowing how to access those forms. So that's one of the things that we do for our patients is we get that um, patient assistant program going for them and get their medications. Um, and if you are diagnosed with an illness and you cannot get your medicine, then that really doesn't mean anything. So the dispensary um, is amazing. And it's, we have people every day coming to get the medicines. And next slide. And health access, and health access to me is something that's truly a brilliant idea. So I wanna turn that over to Linda Askew because she was instrumental in getting that going. So Linda, tell them a little bit about what health access is and what that does. I sure will. Well, in the earlier days, uh, as Lee has said, uh, Good News Clinics focused on primary care. And most, many medical problems can be taken care of in a primary care setting, but some can't. Sometimes you need more advanced testing for diagnosis, you need x-rays, you need lab work that Good News Clinics couldn't do. Uh, some patients might end up needing hospitalization, needing surgery. So unless you can access all of these things, uh, you really can't take care of a person's medical problem. Uh, in early 2000, I think it was like, oh, I don't, long time ago, uh, representatives of the Hall County Medical Society, uh, the Medical Center, the Health Department, Good News Clinics, United Way, that's when I was working with United Way, and several individual physicians, uh, Dr. Chapman, DeLong, Westfall, Rios, and others met and after a good bit of work and study formed what was then a new organization, a separate organization that we called Health Access. And the focus was on specialty care, specialty care that was needed by people who were going to the health department or going to Good News Clinics or that other physicians in the community were seeing. There was no way to get this next level. So this group of very dedicated physicians, one by one, uh, recruited uh, physicians in various specialties to be part of the system. 
and they committed to donating services for a certain number of referrals of qualified patients in their offices at no charge. And they worked out a very coordinated system um, in which if needed, uh, the medical center would provide for the hospitalization, the surgery suite, the labs, the x-rays at no charge. And you know, you need to realize that one patient might require six or eight different referrals to get all the pieces of care that they needed to address their problem. Um, health access was already in, in close uh, partnership with Good News Clinics. And around 2010, I believe, Health Access became fully a service of Good News Clinic, where it functions uh, successfully to this day. And, and I believe Becky is still there, and the, the person that, that, uh, that worked on all the administrative coordination when Health Access first began is still there, uh, plugging along. So I think the annual report for 2019 said there were over 4,000 patient appointments and there are over 300 specialists who are part of the Health Access Network. So it's a, a wonderful uh, supplementary service uh, that, that Good News Clinics is able to provide. Linda, thank you so much. It, it is amazing because if a patient comes to Good News Clinics and the physician sees um, through a mammogram that there's something that needs to be investigated, then we don't just not follow through with that patient. We're able to continue that health journey with them as they move through the different diagnostic possibilities and then possible treatments, whether it's radiation, chemo, surgery, we're there for them and uh, they're part of our family. Before I turn it over to Liz, I wanna tell you that Good News Clinics has left the building recently. We have been hot um, on the trail of vaccination clinics. And we have been, as you probably heard, Liz was on WDUN recently. We have been going out into the community and providing vaccination clinics for COVID. We've always vaccinated against um, things like the flu and childhood diseases, but now we are able to go to Family Promise and provide COVID vaccines for their clients. We've been able to, um, we went to Pilgrim's Pride. We were the first people to go and vaccinate the poultry workers at Pilgrim's Pride. Uh, we've been several places out in the community and we've held clinics on Saturday so that folks can come and get um, that COVID vaccination. We also recently hosted a book study um, and invited other nonprofits in the community to study a book with us called How Our Neighborhoods Make Us Sick. And uh, this month during May, we've been out, uh, we call it Melrose in May. And we have been out, it's May is Hypertension Month, and we have been going every Thursday to Melrose and offering information from cooking and recipes for healthy living to how to take care of our bodies and our minds. Um, how to move and exercise with dance. Um, we've also partnered with uh, the Community Food Bank, the North Georgia Mountains Food Bank to give out food boxes. We've had free books for the kids. We've done tastings. We've tested blood sugar and uh, blood pressure. So Good News Clinics has moved beyond the doors of our building as we seek to bring hope through health care. And Liz is gonna be here to answer questions, but uh, Ron, why don't you pull up your, your screen for a minute and let's, um, as you see Ron's background, you might be wondering how can you help? And I wanna challenge you to, to offer some help. And one thing that you can do is we have our annual Mardi Gras celebration. This celebrates our year of service uh, and it's done in Mardi Gras fashion. We did not have it last year. This is our only fundraising event. It's a dinner with a cocktail hour and information, awards are given. And this helps us make sure that our budget is met as it closes out our year. Our fiscal year runs from October 1 through September 30th. So one of the things that you could consider doing is purchasing a table as a class for our Mardi Gras event. The table is uh, seat six and 
It's $650 that gets you dinner and cocktails and a chance to celebrate with this year's King and Queen of the Mardi Gras, which is former governor and first lady Sandra Nathan Deal. So that's one thing that you might consider. Our church has purchased a table, and so we'll have some folks there representing Good News, uh, Gainesville First Methodist Church. You also, we are putting together blessing boxes and blessing bags for our patients. And if you are interested in collecting some of these items, these are um, not only staples for their pantry to help them uh, eat healthy lives, especially if they are trying to work on a diet that is congestive heart failure or hypertension or diabetes. And also they have a need for some hygiene products to help them with their skin and staying clean. So if Cross Ties would like to put together some blessing bags or blessing boxes, I would be happy to provide you with that list. Um, we would love to have you come and tour. We would love to have you come and so um, I will offer you some ideas and Liz will probably offer some more, but I wanted you to have a chance to see and know Liz Coates because she is truly an amazing leader in this community and has such a heart for our mission. So Liz, I'll turn it over to you for questions and answers. Everybody, please feel to unmute. Before you all do throw any questions my way, I cannot tell you how instrumental so many of, as you've heard, uh, members of your classes both have been in the past, but also um, are in the present. Uh, we've got donors on this, you know, Zoom right now. We've got people who've supported Good News in so many ways through the years, um, long before, as Lee said, she and I came along. But when I hear the stories, Mindy, oh my goodness, it did my heart so good. Um, to hear of Dave Westfall and Susie Harris and Charles House and Jean Peoples and Cheryl Christian and see we'll leave somebody out because that's how it goes and you um I mean I realized that I am sitting in a very um very much a seat of honor and standing on the shoulders of some wonderful community leaders to try to carry out the awesome work of Jesus really um among us and you all paved this awesome trail that um that I'm so glad to be part of now um, our patients are poor. They are very poor. Our patients are incredibly, um, needy in many ways, but you know, just yesterday, I'll just tell you a quick, two, two very quick stories. I can't help it. And then I'll stop. I got excited listening to Mindy and uh, Lee, but, um, just yesterday was uh, Friday. I was in the office and a patient comes back and he's got his mask on and it's an um, older gentleman and I recognize him from around the clinic a lot but I haven't interfaced with him a lot myself and he walks down the admin hall and he says where's the lady that prays for me and I love that we're a place that patients can walk around the halls and say where's the lady that prays for me um, because yes he'll get his health care he'll get his medication he'll get his specialty visits he'll get counseling if he needs it he'll get dental visits but he'll also get that spiritual support. And that's one thing that sets us apart. Um, and our patients uh, need it. They welcome it in many cases and they're so appreciative of it. But we couldn't do what we do without the synergistic. I mean, you heard everybody who's been involved in the evolution of good news and that carries, uh, carries it forth. So um, we're just really grateful to all of you who've had a hand in that and certainly recognize everyone who's involved. One last thing I wanted to mention, um, Somebody was telling me a story yesterday, just socially, um, of you know a coworker who went home to realize that his his sister who lived with him had passed away in her fifties while he was at work that day, because they are poor, they lack health care, and one thing that book on social determinants of health that Lee mentioned we've been studying tells us is that our zip code can tell us basically that we our lifespan is ten to fifteen years shorter than other zip codes. And it's because of it's because of lack of health care and access. And so um, what this gentleman who told me the story yesterday said is he's from a community outside of Georgia was, gosh, we I wish we had a good news clinics in our community and we don't have anything like that. And immediately my mind thought of all the things that should and could have been happening for this woman who lost her life in her 50s that was 
likely preventable because she probably had undiagnosed health issues that had been going on for a long time. And so um, when I think about the interventions that we are making and the difference it makes in people's lives, um, I'm never not excited about what we're doing, <laughs> but I'm also um, really mindful of of how meaningful it is. Um, and we have a lot of gratitude coming from our patients for that. And so it really is a wonderful place to be. 16% of our Hall County population is uninsured and nearly 20% are low income or live below the federal poverty line. We are, um, we've got tens of thousands of people um, who need the services that organizations like ours provide. Um, and yet we serve about 3,500 of them annually. So um, as our community grows, we grow. Uh, we continue to add volunteers uh, to our ranks and um, continue to add services as needed um, as gaps arise in the community. And I'm just so thankful for, for all of you who helped get this thing started because it is, it is an amazing place. And um, I hope that it just continues on strong for so long, but I know that it will because I believe that God's really involved in this ministry. Um, but I also believe that, um, that there are too many, too many who care in this community. We are a resource rich community concern, rich place. And um, if you've lived here and I know all of you have long, then you are very aware of that. So um, it's a good place to be. So now, sorry, I had to, I had to share a few words. Um, what questions or thoughts do you all have as follow-up? I know we might be limited on time, but I'd love to answer any that you have quickly. Uh, what is the difference in the criteria for good news and going to the health department? Um, I think the criteria may be similar, but the, the degree of services that can be offered are a little bit different. I think we, they might go up to 200% of the federal poverty line for income. I'm not completely sure about that, but we align like the NGPG health department. I know we align um, pretty closely, but um, it's sort of like with all charity, no one entity can do it all. Um, there's just too much need. And so we kind of can all pitch in um, to do that, but I think the the criteria is similar, but with government funding, I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure about the health department's ability with regard to, you know, status um, and, you know, citizenship and things like that. Um, so that might be part of the difference, but I can tell you we serve the same income bracket, but our services are not always similar. And they don't have dental, for example, for adults, that's something that only we have. And so that makes us a critical resource for, um, for dental care for adults who are poor. Liz, uh, let me just throw that out that I think that is one important thing about the Good News Clinic is we don't care what your legal status is. The only thing we care about is your health. And so uh, we don't even ask, we only ask about income, residency and those type things. And also, I think the past four weeks, we've talked about how the various nonprofits uh, interact together here. And, and Good News Clinic is definitely a very important uh, cog in that wheel that, that provides services to the other nonprofits as well. There's just to give a quick demonstration of that, there is um, a woman who's been in our care for a while who came to us via Gateway and you know, she came because she had a health concern and she didn't know that we had licensed professional counselors who spoke Spanish on staff. And she's been able to get counseling for her trauma in addition to, um, you know, breast cancer screening that she needed and primary care and all these services that have wrapped around. And um, we actually even had a donor who wanted to help her children at Christmas. <laughs> and so we were able to help, you know, provide some gifts and things, clothing that um, she needed for her children. So it's amazing how these nonprofits work together to wrap around and connect each other to one another services um, to provide care for people who are really experiencing hardships. What other questions? I know many of you are so familiar with us, but certainly if you have any others. When is Mardi Gras? When is Mardi Gras, Lee? <laughs> August, Friday, August the 13th. 
and I Ron like can I'll, I'll, Ron can make sure you guys get information about that. But I hope you will join us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the tables. Um, we have tables available now, certainly, and you know, I think there are ten people can sit at a table, so you might need six or seven for your whole class. I don't know. <laughs> One or two would be a delight, but we'd love to have y'all in any capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. We appreciate what y'all do. Thank you. Liz, one other thing, you know, Gainesville and Hall County is definitely a city and a county of the have and the have nots. We it are is. very fortunate to have some very uh, wealthy people in this county, and we are very fortunate to have so many of those that are caring people that are willing to help the, the less fortunate because, you know, it all makes the wheel go round. If it wasn't for the poultry workers and the landscape workers and all this and that, then, you know, it wouldn't be of a, as rich a place to live as it is. And, and like I said, and they all have to be provided for one way or another, you know. And if I can, maybe, I don't know how we are on time, Linda, but if I could just kind of wrap us up in mentioning that um, Lee referenced that we've, we've left the building. And I love Mindy hearing about our original work with, you know, at the Melrose Community Center, because we're back, we're still there. We're still, you know, serving the um, housing authority community and working alongside them. But we've gone into the community to, you know, Family Promise. I'm sure you're familiar with, the, with Family Promise, um, perhaps with the Hispanic Alliance who serves very poor Latino community among us um, poultry and manufacturing industries with so many employees who are both illiterate um, and do not speak the language. Can you imagine what it is like to live somewhere that you cannot read or speak to anyone? Well, um, very challenging situations, um, as well as our patients with the vaccination efforts and outreach about our services. And so it's just been really great to be part of that. And we did hit a milestone of uh, 1000 vaccinated um, a couple of Saturdays ago. And so we're very um, happy to be participating in that because the population we are focusing on with regard to COVID vaccinations is the one that does not have Wi-Fi, cannot navigate the registration processes. I heard you all talk about online signups. Now imagine that you don't speak English that you may or may not read, that you don't really have technological devices. And if you did, you'd have to go to a McDonald's to find a Wi-Fi and know how to do that just to sign up for the vaccine that you're then gonna have to take off work and lose money to go and, and receive, not once, but twice, because there are two rounds of shots, right? That's who we're trying to accommodate with our employer vaccine um, provision and as well as our Saturday clinics and things like that, we are trying to make it as easy as possible for those who just can't navigate these difficult systems to, to take care of themselves and their families. Um, and we're also talking about, while I think COVID is unbiased and has certainly hit every demographic um, in our nation, in our community, we know that the poor, particularly early on, were disproportionately affected. So we're talking about people who've lost loved ones, experienced the hardship of COVID in ways that, um, you know, not everybody has, and they're hungry and eager to become vaccinated. It has been very impressive to me how much they have embraced the vaccine. And so we want to uh, ride that wave <laughs> and help, um, help that, for, you know, help get vaccinations out for the whole community. So that's been a very, very big effort. And, um, you know, I just feel like, you know, we're here in church together right now, however much church has changed for the last year. Um, and we always go back to it. Good news. It's pretty simple. Jesus laid out a spiritual measuring stick for us. And he said the words, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger, a foreigner. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison and you helped me um, or you didn't. And I love being part of, at least a small part of the ones who do um, participate in that work. And the poor will always be with us and this work will never end. And sometimes that's a little tiresome, right? But um, 
I think the Holy Spirit carries us where the work needs to happen. And so here we are. But um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll pass it back to Linda, our MC, for whatever is next.